Hello and welcome back. Uh, this exercise here, we've already done this problem. We've already completed parts A, B, C, D, and E in the preceding video. So in this, uh, in this video, I'm just going to work on part E. It's the first confidence interval that we've done using the chi-squared distribution. So an interval estimate, not for a mean, but now for a variance. It's going to be a little bit different from uh, the calculations for an interval estimate for a mean. And the reason why is that the chi-squared distribution, as I've said before, it's no longer a symmetric distribution. So the formula for an interval estimate is a little bit different from what we've seen before. So we'll go through a little bit of a, a quick derivation of this. So here we're going to work with a 95% a confidence interval. I'm going to flip over to my chi-squared table so that we can have the discussion on how this is derived. So if we remember from the exercise, if you watch the video for the, the previous parts of this problem, I went through how for these asymmetric distributions, so if this is what my chi-squared distribution looks like, some weird asymmetric shape, all positive values, here we can find two critical values such that in each tail we have alpha divided by 2 which if we're doing a 95 percent confidence interval alpha would be 0.05 so this would be an area of 0 0.025 in that upper tail and we want to also have the same 0 0.025 in that lower tail so this is the same as for the t and the z distribution if i identify these two critical values Beyond this one, 2.5% of the observations. Beyond this one, 2.5% of the observations. Which means that if I draw a number at chance, at random, there's a 95% chance that they will lie between those two critical values. So this is all the same as what we worked with uh, with the T and the Z tables. The difference here is partly due to how these tables are designed. This is giving me just the area in the upper tail. So for this critical value here, chi-squared, this is the chi-squared with 0 0.025 in that upper tail. Well, that one's relatively straightforward. Here I can find there's 0 0.025 in that upper tail. So that one's not so bad. The lower value, again, if I want 0 0.025 in the lower tail, then that means the area in the upper tail is 1 minus alpha divided by 2, which is then 1 minus 0 0.025, which means I want that critical value for a probability of 0.975 in that upper tail, because that would leave me 0 0.025 in the lower tail. So that's where these larger values come into play. Okay, so let's go back to our our problem. So what we're going to do, here I'll have, this is my random chi-squared variable. There's a 95% chance that I draw a chi-squared variable at random and it lies somewhere between that upper value, so that alpha divided by 2 that we just talked about, and that lower value, which is that uh, 1 minus alpha divided by 2 that we just talked about. Now, if I substitute in my value for, a, for a chi squared, this is n minus 1 times s squared over sigma squared. Now, notice I'm not going to put this not to the 0 in there, because that's my hypothesized value. When we're performing a test, there is no hypothesized value. There is only the unknown um, parameter, which in this case is sigma squared. So, 95% chance that that value exists between sigma squared alpha divided by 2 and sigma squared 1 minus alpha divided by 2. Okay, now what we're going to do is just solve for this unknown value sigma squared. So I'm just going to rearrange this and solve for sigma squared. So in order to do that, I'll take the reciprocals of everything, so I'll go with this, oh, I don't want black, let's go back to, let's stick with blue, so sigma squared over n minus 1 
s squared. And if I'm going to take the reciprocals, I either need to change the direction of my inequalities or I need to switch their, switch their positions. So this is going to be less than or equal to 1 over chi squared 1 by 2 and 1 over chi squared alpha by 2. Okay, so there we've got that part done. Now I can multiply through by what I've got in the denominator. And so there's a 95% chance that this unknown value, this sigma squared value, is less than or equal to n minus 1 s squared divided by chi squared 1 alpha by 2 and greater than n minus 1 s squared divided by that chi squared alpha divided by 2. So there's the formula that we're going to be using for this 95% confidence interval. If you remember when we were looking at uh, single population mean, for example, that formula looked a little easier because it was plus or minus some critical value and some standard error. We just had this plus or minus in here because that distribution was symmetric and so these critical values were the same in absolute value. So it was plus or minus that same number. But now with this distribution it's no longer symmetric. So these two critical values are going to be quite different from each other in terms of their magnitude. And so our formula looks a little bit different. So there's no more plus or minus anything. So and now we can uh, go through and we'll use this formula and we'll, f we'll work out the rest of this problem. So I'm going to, let's erase this stuff at the top. We'll keep the formula down below and we'll just fill in our blanks here. So my unknown value, sigma squared, sigma squared, something less than or equal to, so n minus 1 was 40 minus 1. Our sample standard deviation was right here. So this is 0.15 squared. And let's come back to that critical value. And so down here is the same, 40 minus 1 times 0.15 squared. And now I need that other critical value. So let's go to our chi-squared table. And so here, these are those critical values that I want. There's the one for two point, uh, point zero two five in the upper tail, point zero two five in the lower tail. Remember our degrees of freedom here, we had 40 observations, degrees of freedom, 39. I guess that doesn't really make a difference because we don't have 39 on our table anyways, so we have to use 40. So here was that 0.025, so that we come down from there, I have 59.342 is that upper tail value. And that one goes here, 59.342. And then for the other critical value, that was 0.975. And that comes down, I have 24.433. 24.433. So now all we need is our calculator. Let's move this. Can't really get it out of the way. We'll do one at a time. So this is 39 times 0.15 squared equals divided by 24.433. 0 0.0359. 0 0.0359. 359 and finally that lower limit let's come over here so this is 39 times 0.15 squared equals divided by 59.342 point zero one four eight zero one four eight so there we have a 95% confidence interval for the variance of this standard uh, of this distribution. Now, of course, if we look at the problem, it's actually asking us for the uh, population standard deviation. So in order to do that, we just have to take the square root of everything. And so I'll have a 95% confidence interval 
for the population standard deviation is, so let's just take the square root of that, so that's 0.12, 1216, let's round it, let's keep the three decimals, so 122, 0.122, and that upper value, 0.0359 square root, 0.189, 190 actually, that would round to 0 0.190. So there's my 95% confidence interval for the population standard deviation. Now again, does that compare to the results of our hypothesis test? Well, let's see. When we performed that test in the previous video, those other uh, parts of this problem, we found that we rejected that null hypothesis saying that we have evidence to show that it is not 0.12 or it is not 0.12 percentage points. What does our confidence interval say? Well, it certainly isn't 0.12 because I'm 95% confident that it's between 12.2 percentage points and 19 percentage points. So just as when we were looking at tests on means, the same rule applies. That hypothesized value does not exist it's somewhere over here. It's close, but it does not exist within that confidence interval estimate. And that's consistent with a rejection of the null hypotheses. If that hypothesized value did exist within that interval estimate, that would be consistent with a failure to reject the null hypotheses. So here we have it, our 95% confidence interval for both the variance and the standard deviation. And thankfully, it did come out as being consistent with our hypothesis test results. Okay, good. Thank you for watching. I hope this was helpful. Bye-bye.